A federal judge has ordered county officials to remove a statue of the Ten Commandments from the county courthouse. As Whitney Ray tells us from our exclusive Capitol Bureau, officials have less than a month to find a new location for the commandments. 1,800 people call Cross City, Florida home. There are more churches in the town than gas stations, and at the entrance of the Dixie County Courthouse, engraved in stone, are the Ten Commandments. It's our religion. It's our, our Lord. Darcy Patterson says the commandments belong at the courthouse, but a federal judge disagrees. The judge ruled last week the commandments had to go because they violated the separation of church and state laid out in the U.S. Constitution. It has nothing to do with the courthouse. It's our God. It's our God, our maker. Dixie County residents are furious. If they're going to take it down, we should all pick it. Federal judge, he doesn't come down here every day and say this. You know, it should stay. It's not hurting anything. The court battle to remove the statue began in 2007 after the ACLU filed suit. This statue is actually owned by a private citizen. That's the case Dixie County made in court. They also put up a plaque saying the views and opinions expressed in this area aren't necessarily the views of the county, but it wasn't enough to appease the judge. Now county officials have until August 14th to get rid of the statue. Lifelong Dixie County residents Richard and Sissy Elton are sad to see it go. If people don't want to to look at it, they don't want to see it there, turn the head, don't look at it. Come in the back door. Yeah, come in the back door. Residents are asking the owner to place the commandments on private property as close to the courthouse as possible. In Dixie County, Whitney Ray, WPTV News Channel 5. Well, a massive Ten Commandments monument that has been outside a Pennsylvania public school for 60 years is now being removed. And the reason, one complaint from an atheist mother who filed a federal lawsuit. Fox News Radio host Todd Starnes is live for us in D.C. with his take on the controversy in his one-minute commentary. Good morning, Todd. Well, good morning, guys. Yeah, the Ten Commandments is getting the heave-ho from a high school near Pittsburgh. The new Kensington Arnold School District has 30 days to remove the giant monument from the front lawn of Valley High School. It's all part of the settlement in a federal lawsuit filed by an aggrieved atheist. She tells the local newspaper the monument was a violation of the Constitution. She also said the commandments were offensive. And a bronze plaque with the Ten Commandments is no longer on view at the St. Louis County Courthouse in Hibbing. Property management removed the plaque at the direction of county administration on Monday. A county spokeswoman says officials consulted with the county attorney's office, which recommended removing the Ten Commandments based on past court decisions. The Wisconsin based Freedom from Religion Foundation raised questions about the plaque, which had hung at the courthouse for decades. I am Dwayne Etienne reporting for rjbroadcasting.com. Writers at the Christian Post are very upset that a federal judge appointed by Ronald Reagan ruled in favor of Wiccans in a case involving the display of the Ten Commandments at the City Hall of Bloomfield, New Mexico. Now, Wiccans Jane Felix and Buford Cohn of the Order of the Cauldron of the Sage felt offended by the monument contacted the ACLU and asked them to have it removed. Now, Wiccans, don't call them witches. They're Wiccans, okay? They get very upset when you call them witches. See, now, this is why the Christian posts are all upset. They think that the judge ruled in f favor of witches. But no, they're just, you know, Wiccans. They're in favor of freedom of religion, right? That's what they're in, fa in favor of, and we should not have a government entity or a you know even a building related with our government promote a particular religion over another yeah. this is a christian uh, you know set of commandments it's not well, well it's also it's also hebrew let's let's, let's not forget that oh, sorry about that. <laughs> but um alexandra smith the legal director and attorney for the aclu of new mexico said this our clients who are not Christians, they took issue with this and it made them feel alienated from their community. One of the commandments is, Thou shalt put no God before me. And this is clearly not a historical document, but it is, in fact, a religious doctrine. It looks like she forgot about the Hebrews, too. She just mentioned the Christians. Well, <laughs> but I, I take strange. your point. Well, I think it's just because, the, you know, the majority of people in the U.S. who are religious are Christian, yes. and that's a predominant religion. But they were given to Moses. Let's not forget. They're in the Exodus. But...
That's just besides the point, apparently. Uh, U.S. District Judge James A. Parker, when he ruled, said this, in view of the circumstances surrounding the context, history, and purpose of the Ten Commandments monument, it's clear that the city of Bloomfield has violated the Establishment Clause because its conduct in authorizing the continued display of the monument on city property has had the primary or principal effect of endorsing religion. And that's fine because uh, the other other monuments on their property are are you know the Declaration of Independence and various various government documents and not not documents associated with religions and so they won the Christian Post is out of their minds because Wiccans uh, won this and are having the Ten Commandments uh, removed from display. All right, for real, we're going to get started. It is clear to me that everything that we see happening in this nation right now, and actually it's been building for some time, can be defined in no other way than we are in all-out war. There is all-out war. Darkness is creeping over this land, and it is gone to rise up against the light. It wants to remove the light. We, we, we have chaos and lawlessness coming out with a vengeance to come against the law of God. This is what is happening right now. And I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I just, I'm just reminded of Paul's words to the Ephesians. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual hosts of wickedness and the rulers of darkness of this evil age. We are literally in the throes of war right now. It is as hot, it is as intense as it could possibly get. And because of this, because of what we see happening right now, we're going to start a new series on the Ten Commandments. And I'm just going to tell you, um, there have been times that the Lord, the Spirit, has, has moved me to do things, that has moved me uh, to teach on certain things at certain times, and when... You know, it takes a while. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm a little hard-headed. It takes many, many years. I'm only now discovering that it's really the best idea to always listen to the Spirit. And uh, I admit my failures and faults. But when the Spirit moves on me like it has moved on me to, to go this direction, this is not where I wanted to go. I actually had something totally, completely different planned. And I was excited about it. And I'm not supposed to go there. This is where we're supposed to go. You know, there's a, there's a prophecy and, uh, in, in Isaiah, and it talks about prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his, straight, make his path straight. We are at that juncture right now where the literal spirit of Elijah needs to go forth, where the prophets need to go forth, which we have true prophets that are recorded in scriptures, who are inspired by the Holy Spirit, they need, to, they need to be allowed to speak today. Amen? And so we're going to begin this new series. Let me preface uh, this message before we get into it. This is just an introduction. Uh, we're not even going to be getting to the commandments themselves, which you know, I think when I talked to my wife this week about that, she rolled her eyes. But not surprised. But I'm after one thing today. I want to bring to the table a little bit of awareness. I want to bring to the table some perspective so that you can appreciate the magnitude what we are about to embark on. It is going to be instrumental. And so with that said, let me begin with the following statement. I will say this, the Ten Commandments, without question, this is not an exaggeration, it is hands down the most important legal document, the legal set of principles that the world has ever known, period. That's a bold statement. There is no other document in history that has accomplished and done what she has done. There's no other, uh, there's no other accomplished document that has so well influenced men 
and whether you're talking cities and states and countries for the greater good. Nothing has had the impact that this document has had. And that's really something. And, and I think of Proverbs 14, right? So in Proverbs 14, we're told that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. What does that mean? It means when a people, when a society, when a state, when a country embraces righteousness, when they exalt her, when they promote righteousness amongst them, what happens? Blessing. The gates of heaven are open. The favor of God comes upon them. The protection of God comes upon them. The wisdom and understanding of God comes upon them. And it's interesting, you just take it a step further. What is righteousness? If righteousness exalts in it, what is righteousness? And we're told in scripture, Psalm 19, 172, all your commandments are righteousness. All of them. Your commandments are righteousness. And when you have peoples and societies... You have nations, you have fathers, you have mothers in their own homes. Grab hold of the commandments, the Lord will raise you up. The Lord will honor you. The Lord will bless you for that. Amen? That's a, that's a reality. You know, a perfect example of what I'm talking about is America. You know, I look at America, we are the greatest nation that's considered by some, and we've, you know, I've shown you this, some have uh, espoused it to be the greatest nation that's ever existed. Now, we know, obviously, Israel is. But the military might, the power, the pomp, the sheer blessing, the riches, surpasses that of Rome. It's an incredible thought. How did we get here? See, I will tell you, it is because, believe it or not, we were once a nation that valued, that cherished, that honored, that favored, that exalted, that promoted the Ten Commandments. We were. I want to start today by giving you a little bit of evidence to that. And I want to open up with a gentleman by the name of Noah Webster, and he, a prolific author, a political writer. He's considered the, the, the father of American uh, scholarship and education. I mean, a scholar, scholar. Now, this has taken us back to the 1700s. This guy was alive during the Revolution. And so you want to get a good idea, where was America, you know, what was the mindset of men, influential men like Webster? Check this out. This is what he says. He says, education is useless without the Bible. Notice, it's not any other document of any other religion. It's useless without the Bible. The Bible was America's basic textbook in all fields, meaning in all academia, the basis of academia was the word of the living God. God's word contained in the Bible has furnished all necessary rules to direct our conduct. Think about that. I mean, we're getting into American history. This is Americana back in the 17 and 1800s. This is how they thought. They said, this is, these are the rules. We need, to be, we need to submit to them. We need to be governed by them. We need to be educated by them. Why did they do this back then? Because they understood Proverbs 14. This will exalt us. We will get blessing for doing these things. They believed it. They believed in the word. I want to build on this. I want to introduce you to Joseph's story. This guy had a tremendous impact on shaping American jurisprudence. He's known for rendering famous opinions uh, such as the Amistad case, which I think hardly needs an introduction. I mean, this guy has dramatically left his mark on American society in, in the legal arena. Uh, his dad was involved in the Boston Tea Party. I mean, this is, this is Americana, as I would call it. Well, he's also known for co-founding Harvard Law School. And so you want to talk about a guy leaving his mark in history... He co-founds Harvard Law School with another gentleman, interestingly enough, named Simon Greenleaf. He was a Jew. And Simon Greenleaf, a fascinating story. I mean, and I'm going to just say this. Man, you start peering back into history, you start looking at all these guys that helped shape and develop this country, their stories are mind-blowing. Simon Greenleaf's story was as such as that he was a skeptic of the resurrection of Jesus. 
Not, not uncommon amongst Jewish people, right? He was a skeptic. And three of his students challenged him and said, why don't you apply these principles, the treaties of the law of evidence, which he's known for today. I mean, it had a massive impact on legal procedure. And they said to, to, to Professor Greenleaf, they said, why don't you apply your own principles that you've created to the Gospels? And what Simon Greenleaf do? He does it, and what ends up happening, long story short, he ends up confessing the resurrection is legitimate. He cross-examines the witnesses in the gospel and says, this is real. The resurrection is real. Gives his life to the Lord. And it's interesting, then he writes another book called The Testimony of the Evangelist. Unbelievable, you can still buy the book today. Well, this is the guy, Simon Greenleaf is the guy that Joseph Story co-founds Harvard Law School with. Well, there's some words that I want you to know uh, in regard to what Joseph said. And let me say this, just to put this into context. This guy is obviously known for developing American jurisprudence. This guy sat on the Supreme Court for three decades. I mean, if you're going to get back, if you're going to want to get a good piece of history, going back to the 1800s and how we thought, this is an incredible place to start in how Supreme Court justices interpreted the law in relationship to the Bible, in relationship to Christianity. This is what we read. I verily believe Christianity necessary to the support of civil society. In other words, he's saying to, to actually have a civil society, Christianity, it's not an option. You need this textbook, you need the commandments, you need its wisdom. One of the beautiful boasts of our municipal jurisprudence is that Christianity is a part of the common law. Let that sink in. Supreme Court justice literally saying it's interwoven. I mean, that, that alone tells you that this book, the reality of this book, the commandments, is part of our identity, part of our heritage. Then he says this, there never has been a period in which the common law did not recognize Christianity as lying its foundations. The very basis. Let me jump ahead in his commentaries on the Constitution, which you can go online, you can, I would encourage, it's one of the best reads, historical reads, that you're going to dig into. He says this, In fact, every American colony from its foundation down to the revolution, every American colony, foundation down to the revolution, with the exception of Rhode Island, if indeed that state be an exception, did openly, by the whole course of its laws and institutions, support and sustain in some form the Christian religion. And so you know, it's, it's almost hilarious. If the, if the topic wasn't so serious, it's absolutely hilarious to hear people talk about the separation of church and state and how they interpret that. And that how the state is not supposed to lean or promote, as you just heard in the videos... It's not supposed to promote one religion over another. That, that is absolutely not our history. Not at all. Because we just read, and support and sustain in some form the Christian religion, no other religions. And almost invariably gave a peculiar sanction to some of its fundamental doctrines. And this has continued to be the case in some of the states down to the present period without the slightest suspicion that it was against the principles of public law or Republican liberty. In other words, what he's saying is, is Christianity is not the antithesis to liberty and freedom. It's the source. It's the source. And there was no debate about it. There was no conflict between law and the word. Because they're interwoven. This is how they seem. Massachusetts, while she promulgated in her uh, importance and necessity of the Bill of Rights, public support of religion and the worship of God, the language of that Bill of Rights is remarkable for its pointed affirmation of the duty of government to support Christianity and the reasons for it. Now, this is an official statement. You've got to think about this. The Supreme Court Justice Joseph's story is stating that Christianity was being promoted, not any other religion, but Christianity. 
Let me take this a step further. I'm going to introduce you to another Supreme Court justice. David Brewer, who is he's an interesting story, equally brilliant as, Joseph, as Joseph's story, uh, actually comes from parents who were missionaries. He was, wasn't even born in the United States. He was born in Smyrna, the actual Smyrna that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, right? The second church of the seven churches mentioned. Well, this guy has rendered some historic opinions. He also sat in the Supreme Court for over two decades. Now, check out this, this opinion on this case, the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States. I'm going to share some commentary with you from Professor Rainey. And this is what is said. The Church of the Holy Trinity versus United States, 143 U.S. 457. And this is 1892. We're almost to 1900. Let that sink in. Involving the application of federal law forbidding the importation of foreign contract laborers. In other words, there's laws on the books forbidding you being able to hire out foreign laborers. And the whole concept is it's really cheap. You know, dirt cheap. There, there was laws on the books for that. Is notable for Justice David Brewer declaring that the United States is a Christian nation. This is all the way as late as 1892, Supreme Court justice and an official capacity rendering an opinion on a case that was brought to the Supreme Court actually says the United States is a Christian nation. Where is that talk now by our Supreme Court justices? Where is this kind of understanding now? We continue. Brewer added that a legislature representing a religious people would certainly not take action against religion. Now, the, the, the backdrop to the case was, was that the Holy Trinity Church, they went and out and hired an Anglican priest from England. I mean, they wanted him to work and serve as, as, as a minister. And yet the law in the books had, had something, you know, this is where you get in the letter of the law versus what is the intent of the law. And this is, this, this is the depth that David is, is uncovering. He is like the law that was set in place to protect from going into this, this, you know, the federal law forbidding importation of foreign contract laborers. This was not meant for this application for a church going out and hiring a, an Anglican priest from England. It's just not meant for that. And this statement is huge that legislator representing religious people now, this tells me in 1892, this Supreme Court justice looked out and recognized the point of our legislators was to work on behalf of religious people. And when it says religious, it doesn't mean all religions. It means one, Christianity. This is what he saw. Then we move on. He provided an, an overview of references to God in official documents from U.S. history beginning with the commission to Christopher Columbus and continuing through colonial charters, state constitutions, and oaths and office. In other words, Brewer, as he's, as he's rendering this opinion, he goes back and, and actually presents a mountain of evidence to support what today would be called absolutely insane and radical statement that the United States is a Christian nation. He goes back and shows all this evidence to support every step of the way. Just look. It's, it's proof. There's actual proof. Then he moves on. He says this, turning to the Constitution, he offered the First Amendment and the Sunday's accepted provision in Article 1 as evidence of the importance of religion, again, Christianity, in the United States. He just keeps building and building. He also found throughout American life, let's just go look at how people live. From its laws to its businesses, customs, and multitudes of churches, charitable organizations, and missionary associations, further evidence that this is a Christian nation. That's an amazing insight. You want some perspective on how our society used to function? Let all this history, this is real history, let it sink in. I'm going to take this a step further. And... I want to introduce you to the second president of the United States, John Adams. Now, this is going back to the early 1800s. 
One of my favorite quotes by any president ever is the one I'm about to show you. Look at the insight and the wisdom that this man possessed. He says this, I will insist that the Hebrews have contributed more to civilized men than any other nation. If I was an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. What is he talking about? Where is he getting this from? What context is he making this statement? You know what he was referring to? He's referring to what the Jewish people were given. And begin and go back to Mount Sinai. Go back to Mount Sinai. They were given the Ten Commandments. They were given the book of the law. They were given wisdom and understanding, which when you read in Deuteronomy, what we're told is, is the Lord separated them from all the nations. He exalted them. And that exaltation was what? It's because of what God had given them. He had given them a special set of laws that they were to live by that no other nation had. Do you understand some? This is what John Adams recognized. And then you go to the end of Matthew 28 and you get the Great Commission. As Yeshua commissions his Jewish apostles, go out and, and proclaim the gospel, baptizing men in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says this, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. I have commanded you. See, this is what he understood. This is what he knew. This is why he's making such a radical statement. He goes on and says this, they are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited the earth. The Romans and their empire were but a bubble in comparison to the Jews. They have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more and more happily than any other nation, ancient or modern. Yes, it is true. In other words, listen to me, you want life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness? You have to go and get what the Jews got. You have to get the gospel. You have to get those commandments that the Jewish people were given. Righteousness will exalt a nation. We are a long way from home. We're nowhere near hearing people talk like the men that I've just shared with you. And this is just a microcosm. And we could go down this for months. We could go down this road for months. We are not. Now today, yes, we can readily admit we are not a Christian nation. But make no mistake, where we were, where our roots were, and why this nation was blessed, all goes back to our reverence to the Big Ten, to our reverence for God's word, to our confession that Jesus is the Messiah, that there's salvation, that there's forgiveness, there's mercy with him. That's our heritage of blessing in this nation. And that cannot be debated. I want to share a quote with you, and I'm not going to tell you who this is yet. See what you think about this. Pay close attention to what is said. The day will come when I shall hold up against these Ten Commandments, the tables of a new law, and history will recognize our movement as the great battle for humanity's liberation, meaning we're being oppressed, a liberation from the curse of Mount Sinai. This is what we are fighting against, the masochistic spirit of self-torment, the curse of so-called morals, idolized to protect the weak from the strong, against the so-called Ten Commandments, against them we are fighting. See, to this person, the enemy is the Ten Commandments. Who made this statement? Adolf Hitler. Do you understand? This was public enemy number one. What burned in Hitler's heart was hatred for the Ten Commandments. Let me ask you a question. Do you understand? Are you, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Do you understand the power that is in the Ten Commandments, the threat that, that poses to the kingdom of Satan, to the spirit of Antichrist? Understand it. He recognized there is a great power. It was a threat to him. He loathed it. The spirit of Antichrist is the spirit that goes out against the Ten Commandments. Understand something. Every time you see whether they're Wiccans or Satanists or the ACLU or whatever, 
as they go out and they want all the commandments of the living God, the Ten Commandments, to be ripped out from a public place, that is the spirit of Antichrist. It's the very definition. This is the work of evil. It's absolutely demonic. But know this, the commandments are so powerful. What does is, what is, um, Hebrews 4.12 says? Your word, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is a discerner. This is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It prepares you for war. It protects you against deception. And Satan can't have that. The Antichrist wants to have his way in your life. He's got to rip that out. He's got to get rid of those. You cannot be seen the Ten Commandments. Hitler goes on, he says this, the Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Conscience is a Jewish invention. It is a blemish like circumcision. The Ten Commandments have lost it. You know, it's always fascinated me how Hitler directly correlates conscience with the Ten Commandments. This is what he says. Let it sink in. Direct correlation. It's amazing. Why? Because... The Ten Commandments have the power to speak to your heart and to transform your life. There's power. We're told in 1 Kings, right, chapter 8, where the word of the king is, there is power. Where that word is. Don't be mystified at why they're trying to move, remove all the Ten Commandments so that we don't have these. It's not just simply a monument. This is not simply freedom of speech. Oh my goodness, it goes way beyond that. This is war. And the darkness does not want the light to be seen. The darkness does not want the light to be heard. And even scarier than all that, what troubles me the most is this statement, the Ten Commandments have lost their validity. That's the very narrative that has crept into the churches. You can't, think about it. The very narrative that is creeping into this church is in this generation is we don't have to do them. We don't have to keep the commandments. Let me, let me share with you a few screenshots that uh, these are Christians, mind you. And the question here of the first one is, which of the Ten Commandments are outdated? Okay. The answer, all Ten Commandments became outdated when Jesus gave us the two greater commandments. And when he died on the cross, this is because there is no longer any atonement for the transgression of the Ten This stopped when the animal sacrifices were ended. Jesus became the atonement for the two that he gave us, which fulfills all the law and the prophets. See, the Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Now, this is mind-blowing. This is, it's it's honestly mental gymnastics that I got to play just to understand what he's trying to convey. But essentially what he's conveying this, that you understand what he's saying. He is saying the animal sacrifice is atoned for the sins that were committed and when the Ten Commandments were broken, okay? But when Jesus came on the scene, he taught two commandments, and it's for those two commandments that he died. And so, because there's no more animal sacrifices, there, therefore there's no more atonement for the ten. They, they certainly can't apply to us. There's only atonement for the two commandments. I mean, do you see the insanity here? Do you see the, the, the confusion that the enemy is causing? Let me click on another. Here's another screenshot. You gotta love this. Ten Commandments are the old covenant that was abolished at the cross. And don't you love his little pictorial here? False doctrine hits the mat. The logic is irrefutable. Three points of analysis here. It's very simple. The Ten Commandments are the old covenant. Number two, the old covenant was abolished. Number three, the Ten Commandments are therefore abolished. It's a simple deduction said Hitler. This is Hitlerian speech. And and let's be clear, the spirit of Antichrist moved through Hitler. You might want to pay attention to some of the things that he said, especially in regard to the Ten Commandments and how he's obsessed with making sure those were destroyed. And yet this is in the church. Let me take it a step further. Here you have 242 Community Church, another screenshot from their website. The Ten Commandments are obsolete. And we read this. Here's just some of what was written. Here's what the writers of the New Testament say about the law of Moses, which includes the Ten Commandments. Special attention to the Ten. By calling this covenant new, 
He has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete in aging will soon disappear. Hebrews 8.13. Thank you, Lord, for making me go through the book of Hebrews. Because this is, do you understand how important it is? One of the things that I mentioned in that series, and it is so imperative, is that the problem with the church today is they do not understand the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. What has stayed and what has gone. They do not understand what the new covenant in and of itself is, let alone knowing what the old covenant is and the differences. They don't understand. You know what the devil's doing? He's taking advantage of the situation. He's taking advantage of this situation. And then, of course, we have, uh, he's kind of becoming quite notorious around here, Andy Stanley. Why do Christians want to post the Ten Commandments and not the Sermon on the Mount? As though, people, the Sermon on the Mount is a completely different message than the Ten Commandments. That's what's being alluded to here. Listen to me. Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? You can't even make this up. Yeshua actually teaches, he draws out from the Ten Commandments. He's quoting them. It's unbelievable. It's the greatest exegesis, it's the greatest discourse on law you will find anywhere in Scripture, is Yeshua's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all about law. You, know, you get through the Beatitudes, and then immediately you're confronted with uh, Matthew 5, 17. Don't think that I came to destroy the Torah. Don't think that. And then he goes all the way through Matthew 7 after talking about the commandments and what they really mean. Then he goes to Matthew 7 and, you know, we got a bunch of believers in Matthew chapter 7 thinking they're getting in. Lord, Lord, open to us. And he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The whole discourse of the Sermon on the Mount is on the law. It's unbelievable. I mean, this is how far away from reality the church is getting. Well, within this, we read the following You've heard the story before. A group of Christians put up a monument of the Ten Commandments in a public space or on government property. Someone says it violates the separation of church and state. Now, everything he's saying here, right on. Agree. This is the debate. But then he says this. The Christians say taking it down would violate their freedom of speech. There's some back and forth in court, and both sides say some not-so-great things about the other. Rinse and repeat. Big problem I have with this statement is right here. The Christians say taking it down would violate their freedom of speech. Please hear me out right now. Now, while you might have some Christians that say, hey, I want the right to exercise my freedom of speech. I'm concerned about my freedoms being impeded on here. Understand this. Posting the Ten Commandments is not about making sure I exercise my freedom of opinion. That's not what it's about. It's about eternal life. That's what it's about. That's how important these are. It's about bringing light into a dark place. It's about bringing conviction. It's about giving wisdom. It's about giving understanding. It's life and death. This is not simply about my right to to express my opinion. It matters. Posting the Ten Commandments matters. But how many times... Have you seen Christians trying to post the text of the Sermon on the Mount in a public place? I would be happy to. On the all-encompassing or the all-encompassing commandment uh, commandment Yeshua gave us, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Exclamation here with the, the one commandment. Doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? But if we're going to create a monument to stand as a testament to our faith, shouldn't it at least be a monument of something that actually applies to us? See, he's coming out and saying it doesn't apply to Christians. The Ten Commandments. And again, I remind you of Hitler's words. The Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Moving on, the Ten Commandments are from the Old Covenant. He's going to give us this reasoning. The Ten Commandments played a significant role in God's creation of the nation of Israel. Agreed. It gave them moral guidelines and helped separate this new nation from their neighbors. Agreed. This part of the formal agreement or covenant God created with his people, but Yeshua's death and resurrection signaled the end of that covenant and all the rules and regulations associated with it. 
Yeshua issued his new commandment as a replacement for everything in the existing list, including the Big Ten. You understand, this is, this is where we're at. This is the narrative that is not just being peddled by the ACLU or being peddled by Satanists. This is a narrative that's being peddled by the church, saying the exact same thing Hitler once said. I want to build on this. We're going to go global. I want to take you to China. And the headline reads as follows. Xi Jinping quotes replace the Ten Commandments in churches. The Ten Commandments are the basis of Christian moral code. An essential part of believers' life throughout the world, but in atheist China, they have become... Um, hang on a second, guys. We'll try to go backward here. Okay, they have become an eyesore for the country's dictator and are eliminated from places of worship. Then we move on. Here we go. Even though a state-run three-self church in a county of Luoyang City in the central province of Henan has replaced the Ten Commandments with President Xi Jinping's quotes, After repeated demands, it didn't escape reprimands from the government. The party must be obeyed in every respect. The Chinese Communist Party is what it's referring to. You have to do whatever the party tells you to do. If you contradict, your church will be shut down immediately according to a believer who asked to remain anonymous. Against the will of believers, the Ten Commandments has been removed from nearly every three-self church and meeting venue in the country and replaced with quotations from Xi Jinping. We're starting to see whether it's Hitler going after the Ten Commandments, communism goes after the Ten Commandments. We're seeing this broken record play over and over again. The Ten Commandments are a threat you think about Satan when he, when he was in the Garden of Eden, went to deceive Eve. What did he go after? The commandment. Did God really say? God spoke. God spoke the commandments to Adam and Eve. And Satan comes in and calls into question, did God really say? And what does Satan want? What is the goal? The goal is don't listen to his word. Slide that aside. Receive my words. What is President Xi Jinping doing? Move the voice of God aside, move the commandments of sky aside, and you will listen to my words. This is the devil in the making. Like excerpts from his speech at a Central United Front Work Department working meeting on May 18, 2015, the core socialist values in Chinese culture will help to immerse, and this is a quote from Xi Jinping. So this is what you're seeing now that he wants in the churches. The culture will help to immerse various religions of China, support religious community in interpreting religious thought, doctrines, and teachings in a way that confirm with the needs of the progress of the times. In other words, guess what? Oh, oh, oh church, oh, blessed church amongst uh, the Chinese people, know this, you know what? We're going to immerse your churches in communism. We're going to help you so that you can keep up with the times so that we can make sure that your churches are doing what is best for all mankind, for humanity. What's best? This is the mindset. And don't think for one second we're not even seeing this mindset right here in our own country today. This is the mindset we are seeing The believer also revealed that some three self-churches had been shut down for not implementing the government's demand to replace the Ten Commandments with the president's quote. Because it's really simple. You will do what we say or we're coming after you. We will shut you down. It's amazing. I just think of over the last year and a half, right, Uh, in regard to COVID. We're shutting you down. If you don't get shut down, We're going to make you pay. I mean, how many churches got fined for keeping their doors open? I mean, you can't even make that up, right? Massive fines in the hundreds of thousands because they would not stop meeting to give Yeshua glory. That was unacceptable. It's unacceptable in communist ideology. 
Some congregations have been threatened to be blacklisted by the government, meaning that their travels will be restricted. And schooling and future employment of their offspring will be impeded if they refuse to overhaul their churches according to the current national policies. In other words, if you don't let the devil in to your church and you rip the holy word of God down from your walls, your kids are going to pay. We will see to it. Now you think about that. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices Are you guys ready to stand? Are you guys ready to cling to the commandments of God at all costs? Will you hold the line when this pressure comes down on you? This is a reality. Where are we? Okay. The government's first step is to prohibit religious couplets and all these, you know, you can't have any religious literature flittering about with hope and encouragement and the ways of wisdom can't have any of that then it dismantles crosses so any symbol that would take you back to the bible or even would make people think about jesus is unacceptable and starts to implement the four requirements by ordering the national flag and the core socialist values to be placed in churches, surveillance cameras to monitor believers and religious activities are then installed. I'm really excited about that. The last step is to replace the Ten Commandments, the crescendo. The last step is to replace the Ten Commandments with Xi Jinping's speeches. The preacher gave his analysis of the situation in three self-churches. Listen to this. The Communist Party's ultimate goal is to become God. And there it is. Listen to me, this activity that you see to eradicate the word of God, which is his voice, it is the power of God, is the enemy coming in to take the throne, to be worshipped. He wants worship. The communists want to be God. There's no debate on that. Let me share with you uh, a not too recent headline. This is a screenshot. YouTube blocks Prager U 10 Commandments videos, restricts to mature audiences. Listen to this. YouTube is restricting access to Prager U's videos on the 10 Commandments, labeling it as mature content that's inappropriate for sensitive audiences. But never mind the fact that your 8, 9, and 10 year old kids have free access to porn. Uninhabited. Never mind that, we're we're worried about this. Do you guys understand the Ten Commandments? The enemy is hovering over. This is the target. This is the target. This is the ultimate target. We, we, We gotta be aware of this. We need to wake up as to what's going on. I wanna take you to Jeremiah 6. And I'll read it and then I'll comment. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ears uncircumcised and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. And you look at our nation, what's happening right now, they have no delight. It's offensive just to see a monument of the Ten Commandments anywhere is repulsive to the inhabitants of this country right now. You have guys literally driving cars into the monuments of Ten Commandments to take them out. That's the insanity of what we see. There's so much hatred they, want, they do not want to submit to God. They don't want to see God's words. They want to remove God. They want to rid him from the land. Now, here's the thing. When Jeremiah was sent, he was sent to proclaim the very things that I'm telling you about. The Ten Commandments. He was sent to proclaim, you need to repent and turn from your wicked ways. But when that nation had come to this point, when they had come to the point where they were so over the line and they didn't want to hear it and they were repulsed and offended by his commandments, that's when judgment was looming. God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, the Lord will sharpen his sword. He will bend his bow. He's going to take you out. And so we got to understand how close we are. This situation, that has to impress upon us more to share the gospel. 
to share the mercy, the forgiveness, the hope, the beauty that is in the gospel, in Yeshua, in him, and we got to turn back. And the Ten Commandments need to get posted everywhere. This is our guidebook. Isaiah says this, now go write it before them on a tablet and note it on a scroll that it may be for a time to come forever and ever. Now I'm going to stop here. The Lord is taking Isaiah the prophet and he's sending him with a message. Notice what he commissions him to do. This is a little tidbit of irony. Write it before them on a what? On a tablet. See, when Israel went to Mount Sinai, what did they receive? They received the law written on tablets, literally. And then he goes on to say, and note it on the scroll. They were also given what we call the book of the law. It's a real, you got to follow this because the Lord is being clever here. And so he sent an Isaiah to a sinful generation and he's telling them, write it on a tablet, note it on a scroll. What are we to do? What, what, what is it that he wants on that? It's this, that this is a rebellious people, a lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord. See, that's a rebellious generation. It's a lying children that will not hear his commandments. And what are his commandments? It's his voice. They will not hear the word of the Lord. This is what was to be on those things. Absolutely amazing. Verse 10. Who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. This is the declaration. Every time somebody goes and a court order is given to remove the Ten Commandments, that's what they've declared. They have made this declaration. I don't think we really understand how serious our situation is. This nation has declared they do not want the Holy One. They want the Holy One to cease from them. They want to rid him from this land. Hosea 8.12. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. You know, the psalmist says, open my eyes that I may see great things from your law. This series is about this. It's about digging in and to go find and discover the great things of God's law. And that's what we're going to do. And so with that said, we're going to close. 